tinfoil hat. Oh, what the fuck are you guys even talking about? Global controls will have to be imposed. And a world governing body will be created to enforce them. Welcome to Tinfoil Hat. We, we, we go deep, homeboy. Eric, open your mind. Drink from the fountain of knowledge. There's lizard people everywhere. That's some interdimensional shit. Wake up, Aaron. This is only the beginning. Dude, you just blew my mind. Are you ready to get your mind blown? Good morning, Swarm Man. Welcome to Tim Fall Hat. You know I am. You know I'm here to do. I'm here to rock. Joining me as always, Xavier Guerrero. And on the ones and twos, Jay Nice, Ooh. Johnny Woodard. Guys, we're going to yeah. get right into it real quick. Go to samtriplee.com. Check out my dates. I have a show tonight. Thousand Oaks. Go grab tickets are moving. Finally, thank you. Then no- uh, November, October 22nd. I'm in the main room at the comedy store. I don't know why that's not up there. Uh, we got a murder lineup. Go check that out. It's one of, uh, we, we've lowered the price since the Sunday. And then November, go up a little more. Wow, those aren't up there? That's crazy. Wow. That's crazy. I Go up. That's not on there. That's, no, that's so it. weird. Yeah. Okay, that's I don't know why that those were up there. Uh, November third, I'm in Indianapolis, and number and uh, November fourth, I am with uh, Eddie Bravo and Xavier Guerrero in mm-hmm. St. Louis. Go grab those tickets. Those dates will be up there, and we'll get into some more stuff on the website later. Uh, very excited to have our guest back. Uh, he is an author. He has a new book. Out called Wisdom of the Yogi. Uh, he's a professor at Arizona State, and we are honored that he comes and hangs out with us. Please welcome Riz Verk, everybody. How are you, sir? Uh, doing well. How about yourself? Good to be back with you. We're blessed to have you here. I'm very excited to talk to you. I just saw an amazing um, video on yogis and the yogi that is uh, pictured on your book about how he basically decided to, like, call the day and wrap it up and leave his own body. I don't know if that's real, but I'm very excited to talk to you. Uh, before we get into it, for our guests who may not uh, have seen your last appearance and listened to your last appearance on the show, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and where our guests can find you, where our listeners can find you? Sure, absolutely. So, you know, I, I started off my career as a computer scientist, became an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, and I created and ran a few video game companies uh, we had the number one game in the App Store for a while. This is uh, going back a few years now, uh, which we sold to a big Japanese company. Then I became an investor and venture capitalist, invested in a bunch of companies like Discord, et cetera. And then a few years ago, I decided to focus in on my writing and, and move back into academia. Uh, I was running a, a startup program at MIT for a while, wrote a book called The Simulation Hypothesis, which is about the idea that all of this isn't really real, but that we live inside a video game kind of like in the matrix. Um, and uh, now, as you mentioned, I'm at ASU and just uh, wrote this book about Yogananda and uh, you know his impact on the West through his book, Autobiography of a Yogi, which was a huge bestseller. Uh, and so, so that's kind of what I'm up to now is continuing simulation-related research and teaching some classes and talking about yogis. Uh, quick question. Why do we move from MIT to ASU? Is that, is it a weather thing, a more attractive student body? What are we, what are we talking about? Oh, well, yeah. Weather for one thing. Absolutely. (laughs) You know, I I lived in Boston for, uh, you know, over a decade and I'm not a big fan of the weather there. (laughs) So that's, that's part of it. Gotta get that dry heat and that, uh, no state tax. Yeah, absolutely. And then there's also, you know, ASU is kind of known as the Santa Cruz of universities these days. And like back in the 60s, Santa Cruz was the university where they like mixed up all the departments. They changed all the titles. They were very experimental. And so ASU is kind of seen as oh, like the experimental that. university these days. Yeah, I like that. I love Phoenix. I love ASU. My brother went there. My cousin's going there now. So I love the campus. It's very cool. Very cool. Very fun area right there, too. Uh, Arizona is very underrated. It's purple. It's a little bit of everything. I love it. So, I mean, I'm really like, I, I, I'm, I'm really on this spiritual journey. Been reading the Bible. 
Uh, but I'm still into the mysticism. I'm learning a lot about that, and I'm still in the simulation theory. And I'm very open minded to how, maybe it all fits together in some kind of way. Uh, let's get into a little simulation, then we'll get into the yogi because I do love yogi. And again, I'm onto that spiritual journey. Um, what, what's it? Well, so you have a simulation class at ASU. Yeah, so this is probably the first uh, college level class that's de dedicated to this idea that we live inside a computer simulation. And the, the the title of the class shows how interdisciplinary it is, right? So it's called Simulation Theory, Technology, Science Fiction, Religion, and Philosophy. And, you know, it really is, uh, it really does cut across all of those areas. Because if you look at it, you know, even though I came at the simulation idea from the perspective of Silicon Valley, you know, so I was at that point an investor. I had sold my last video game company. And I think I told this story last time, but I put on a virtual reality headset and I started playing this uh, virtual ping pong game. And it wasn't even like a really high resolution game like you would see today. And this was like seven years ago. So it was pretty basic. And yet the responsiveness was so good that it fooled my body for a moment to thinking that I was playing a real game of table wow. tennis. And so I tried to put the paddle down on the table and I tried to lean against the table. Of course, there was no table. <laughs> so the controller fell to the floor and I almost tripped and fell over. And so I said, now, wait a minute, how long is it going to take for us to get to the point where we can create something like the matrix, something that's so immersive that I would not be able to tell. Obviously, in this case, I knew there was a big headset on my face. There were wires from the ceiling. And yet still for a moment, you know, I forgot. And so I call that the simulation point, which is like a technological singularity. Now, you guys have probably heard the term singularity used in terms of like AI and the apocalypse. And yes, yes. <laughs> so this is a different kind of singularity, right? Well, the guy who defined that term was a sci-fi writer and computer science professor named Werner Vinge, uh, who wrote a paper way back in the 80s about the technological singularity. And he said it's a point at which technology grows so fast that there's you, you pass a point of no return. So you can't really go backwards. And so most people think, well, that's like AI getting exponentially smart to the point where it's going to basically decide to get rid of us, right? That's what we're all <laughs> worried about, right? But there's a different kind of singularity here, which is that at the point when we can create virtual reality that is indistinguishable from physical reality, we'll have AI characters in there, and we won't be able to tell whether they're real or programs, like, like Agent Smith in The Matrix, right? Uh, and at that point, uh, so we'll have at least AGI, artificial general intelligence, at least within the virtual world, but we'll also have this kind of immersive ability. Now the question becomes, what will we do, yes. right? Will we spend all our time in this virtual? I mean, if you could basically go into this virtual world and have any experience you want, and it would feel as if it was real, right? It, like, like think, think back to Total Recall, right? You remember that movie? Yes, one of the classics. Yeah, I like the Schwarzenegger version. <laughs> you know, and, and, and they said it's much cheaper to get a vacation through recall because you get all the memories than to actually go on the vacation yourself. And so, you know, there was that big question at the end of the movie, did it really go to Mars or was this whole adventure just part of, you know, what they beamed into his brain? Well, um, it is sorry. interesting, dude. So, so, you know, Mark Zuckerberg tried to make the big meta launch and by, by some accounts, I don't know if all accounts, you know, depends on what your measurement is. Is it, is it the word on the street? Is it the stock market? Whatever that may be, Wall Street. Um, it wasn't the success maybe he had hoped, but yesterday Johnny and I were talking and Johnny now got the goggles and he Apple, is based Apple Vision Pros? No, no, those aren't out until next year. Okay, uh, I was like, whoa. No, but I, I got the new, you know, the MetaQuest, the new yeah. one. I, but I've been, I bought in since the beginning. I mean, I had DK1, the, the, the right. first developer kit. But you're Oculus telling Gen. me like this is like. But the new one, yeah, it's 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 a, it's a, it's a leap forward for consumer VR for sure. There have been things that are this good, that that were much more expensive, but in this range, yeah, it's fantastic, and they're. And and also the on the software side they're they're keeping up. Now I have a gaming PC that helps a lot, but yeah, I mean there's there was a there's a 
there's this game Half Life Alex, and there's this community of modders that have grown up around it that are making the the most realistic Sims uh, you know that I've seen of of sort of like fighting Sims, like gun fighting and stuff. And it's uh, oh, it's so it's engrossing at this level. But the quantum leap from like what it was. Oh, what it was, man. I mean, I, I remember. I mean, the the demos that that were striking in the beginning was just a room. You know, there was. I remember one was like an Italian villa, yeah, or like a Tuscany. It was, it was Tuscany. That's what it was. And it was just a house in Tuscany that you kind of walked around the best way you could with a gaming controller at, at very low resolution. Now, do to you now. feel that you could be trapped in like? Do you feel like? You have this urge to rush back there. Well, I remember, and I mean, I think this is even depicted in the film about Tetris, but remember, do you ever play Tetris and then you see it when you close your eyes after? Did yeah. You ever yeah. Play it? <laughs> think about what that yep. what that's going to be like for something that is, is is involves, you know, just fully enveloping your field of view and and, 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 and is, is at some point, you know, indistinguishable like the... Do you think Apple's? Says. Do you think Apple's version that's going to come out is going to be a game changer? I don't think there's going to be many gaming applications for that XG, oh, but no? I, I do think for for mixed reality and, and and productivity, yeah, for sure. It sounds like it is, yeah, and and entertainment. It'll be crazy yeah. if if we get to a point where it's so so realistic that people just start to work inside there. Oh, well, people are already the, the the early adopters already are. Yeah. Uh, because yeah, because I mean, you can did you see them. the uh, like the Apple Vision Pro where you can project your screen yeah. kind of up in front of you and it's a giant high resolution screen and and so you see the point you know how the technology might change after that like getting rid of monitors for example Absolutely. Uh, but the, the size is still an issue right so at some point yeah. things are going to get down to the the, the size of glasses that I have here I don't know if you guys have ever like seen some of those like skyscrapers where you know you're standing at the edge or in a canyon and suddenly your feet don't want to move to the left or to the right because yeah. your your yeah. your body is telling you you're going to fall over right and that was I tell the ping pong story but that was another one of the very first things I saw that with Oculus startling back in the day what did um, yeah. what, what did um Lex Friedman and what's his name use on their podcast I don't know yeah so now if you if you saw that podcast it was really ultra realistic right so they were probably using a dev version of a future headset it could have been the current the quest 3 that was just released but if you saw how realistic it was it took them a while to get there so like lex had to go to like the meta offices and get his face scanned but you know it was at the point where like the five o'clock shadow was showing right that's how realistic it was uh but if you project forward now even further to something like the matrix, uh, you get to photorealistic VR, AR, but then you get like potentially brain computer interfaces, right? Oh, and now, this stuff is out there still, right? But you saw, but you may have seen the video with Elon Musk and Neuralink and the monkey. Did, did you guys see yes, that? Yes, yes. The monkey I... was playing a video game and guess what game it was? It was Pong, the original, you know, kind of video game from Atari that was like a little ping pong game with yeah. two squares and a dot. My jam. And, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the monkey was using the the joystick, and they were giving him rewards if he played right. And at some point, they disconnected the joystick. The monkey still thought it was playing with the joystick, but they were actually reading his brain signals uh, or his or her brain wow. signals. And, and he was controlling the actual game, right? So it's going to take some time to get there, but that's sort of the next few stages. And eventually, you can potentially think of copying the human brain, uploading or downloading consciousness. Now we get into Do you get nervous issues. about that? I mean, you're a super smart guy. We're weird conspiracy theorists. Do you get <laughs> nervous about that? I, I do get somewhat nervous about that, right? And I mean, I, for one, don't want to have uh, invasive BCIs or brain-computer interfaces, right, which require, like in the Neuralink case, they install a little chip. But there are plenty of non-invasive BCIs out there where they can just read with a headband. They can read, uh, you know, all of those, uh, all of your thoughts. And it's it's really an AI problem of classifying. Like they can read the signals. They just don't know what you're trying to say or think about. That's but so if you crazy. restrict it to say, go left, go right, go up or down, they can easily tell by just by watching what you do. Like with the monkey, they just watched what, he, what the brain signals did. And then if you add, you know, lots of other options to that, you can start to get to the point. And I think they've done experiments like this where they can, given a set of choices with humans, they can pretty much figure out which of those choices you're thinking about. Uh, and people can control using you know, their eye movements, 
their brain signals and other things as well. Uh, like a video game type thing. They've also reconstructed uh, now, images too, right? From people's minds, you know, like identified what they're picturing. I've seen that like in low resolution, but think really? about it, like mind reading. Yeah, mind reading. Oh man. Yeah, very low resolution. Now, where it gets really scary though is when you start beaming stuff into the brain. That is Whoa. voice of skull, yeah, all that stuff yeah. that you know they have, bro. You know they yeah. got that. <laughs> and the, what are the implications of that? And... Yeah. I mean, like, do you have my whole thing is like, OK, these technologies are great unless it gets into the wrong hands and used for the wrong reasons. And that's where I get really nervous because I have zero faith in in some of these institutions on having any of those ethics yeah. to uh, to not yeah. cross a, bo a line that we may not be able to come back from. Kind of like what you were talking earlier. Like, it makes me nervous. Like, what does the CIA do with this? You know? Yeah, I mean, it's they just, got it. I think they got it. If you could do it, they probably. Oh, I know they have. But what are they doing? Yeah. Right? That's. I mean, they have yeah. no scruples about using, it, especially abroad. I mean, like yeah, when people like for hit, testing in, in in like other areas. You know, they yeah. tend to use that stuff first outside the U.S. before using it inside. That said, I you know the commercially available technologies is what I'm familiar with, and they're not quite there yet. They're at the point where they can beam certain signals. That might have certain effects, but they're not at the point of being able to beam specific memories and things like that, uh, you know, in, into your brain. That that's going to come down the road, I think. You know? Oh, that's so crazy! And how? Like, like you, yeah, go on. Sorry, I was going to say. You remember the scene in the Matrix where you know they plug in the different cartridges, right? And yeah. he, that's he the gets only the thing truck. I want. I just want to download jujitsu. That's all I want to do. I want to download jujitsu so I can go right to it and go back and mess up that high school kid that was jacking me last night. In class. You could do that actually. You could relive your memory in your own brain and like beat his ass. Yeah, no, but I want to go. Down. Oh, I know jujitsu and just really. show up and just choke this kid out. Yeah. Well, okay, but okay, let's let's go to those times where you could download that. Or you can download the time you went to Mount Everest. Is that still yeah. going to be clarified as you doing it? Or you still think we're gonna live in these real times? We're like, oh, those aren't real Jordans. Won't like, I can relevant. still see fake Jordan. And be like, for some reason, even though they look exactly the same to okay. me, they're still fake. Yeah, you really didn't go to Mount Everest. I don't care that you downloaded it. I can do that. Did you actually put foot on Mount I know, Everest? I don't. I never thought about that. I don't. I don't know if that is. Not sure it's a meaningful distinction. Really, it won't be anyway. I don't think people will care when you can tell. Yeah. What's interesting yeah. though, if you think about once we get. The Internet of Things fully, you know, uh, established and and every object in reality has been scanned and has its own digital duplicate. Then you can simulate reality and possibly simulate. You can you can fold roll that back to the past and time travel to the past potentially because if every var variable is accounting accounted for and you have enough compute power, you could potentially. S Roll, you know, go back to like ninety seven and hold and, on, and, you're and, in like real time travel well, in in a simulated time travel and, and and into the future because if if it if you have an a, a, you know enough bandwidth to and compute power to account for every variable in reality in a certain space, then you could extrapolate that forward and are you and roll it back to the past because yeah. in a weird way, are you saying they could? rewrite history in the simulation that it basically becomes reality here in the real world no no i i well uh, possibly. well that would what depend on is... being in the simulation right yeah <laughs> but exactly yeah, I, yeah. Uh, yeah. i well, think what I he's mean, saying though right now is that you can basically create so you remember when notre dame had a fire a few years ago yeah and they had to kind of fix it up they went to assassin's creed you know the company that makes assassin's creed had done a full 3D scan of the entire cathedral. That's and that's crazy. what they used, right? Because they, they it's so realistic inside the game, right? And so we're at the point where the the structures are very realistic inside the game. And we can create what are called ancestor simulations to a certain degree, right? Which are simulations of the past. Now we can't, you know, we're not at the point where we have full AI characters that can really, you know, you can interact with yet, but we're getting there faster too with chat GPT and everything else. So I think that's that's coming along, this ability to recreate. If you guys have ever seen the movie The 13th Floor. Um, Not for a long time, which, but I do remember seeing that, yeah. Yeah, so it came out in 1999, and it got kind of overshadowed by The Matrix. But it's actually my favorite simulation movie because really? it shows some of these concepts better 
they were in the 90s and they basically created a full simulation of 1937 Los Angeles, right? So they were in the 90, 99 LA and they would go back there and they're like, these people are real. I mean, everything in here feels so real. Uh, and then when one of the bartenders there found out it was a simulation, he started to freak out, right? Because they were like NPCs. They were like non-player characters in video games. And then you could basically take over one of those avatars and you could play them. And then later, I'll spoil oh. it, but it's a 20-year-old movie, right? Or more yeah, than yeah, one, right. 20 years Spoiler old. alert. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Turns out 1999 is also a simulation in that. Oh, <laughs> it's a simulation God. from the future, let's say 2041, or I forget what year it was, in the future. Uh, but I think that's the kind of time travel that they, that we're talking about here now. But if you get to the the broader question, which we haven't gotten to yet, which is, if we can create simulations that are so realistic, right? And this is what the simulation argument put forth by Nick Bostrom at Oxford says uh, that got this whole ball kind of rolling in academia and got Elon Musk to say the chances that we are in base reality, which would be not in a simulation, is one in billions, which means the chances that we are in a simulation is billions to one. It's so crazy. Uh, right? But he said, if you can create those, then you just have to do another server. So you can basically create millions of different simulated worlds. There's only one real world. And so if you are inside a world, are you more likely to be inside a simulated world or are you more likely to be inside base reality? Well, that's the logic, one in billions, right? There's one of these, there's billions of those yeah. with trillions of beings. So if we can get there, uh, and that's kind of, you know, part of my contribution here is the simulation point, which is when we can get there, uh, then someone's probably already gotten there and we are probably already inside one of those simulations. That's so crazy, right? It's just like, is this the simulation? But there is one that's one, right? There's one that had to create it. We just did yeah. it. Well, I but mean, the chance of it that's being the whole us argument. Is, the chance of it being us is very slim as well. A what? watch implies a watchmaker. So yeah. if you go and and you go, hey, I believe we're in a simulation, then that would imply there's some made the simulation. And, you know, as we as we go deeper into social media, and I don't know what the future of social media is. I, I feel this kind of turn happening on social media where people are starting to get kind of turned off by it. It's, uh, it's so much data all at the same time. And and it's kind of getting where the, cra the crazy, the, like there used to be like a, cr uh, a, 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 town, a village idiot. But now it seems like it's all village idiots, whether it's Instagram models over-sexualizing or everyone yelling about their political takes. Uh, you're drowning out the moderates, <laughs> which seems to be like the one thing Facebook, as much as you could hate Facebook, seems to be like, oh, that's where you go and find out what your cousins and your aunts and your grandmas are up to, right? Mm -hmm. And in the end, the one that everyone thinks is dying may be the only one left because people are kind of over which is getting into like the simulation that is going on where it's like, my belief is like, we're almost all becoming our own dimension in that we have these algorithms that are feeding us information and deciding based on what it thinks our tastes are giving us what our want, what we want and excluding what we don't want. Well, think about the implications of now what extrapolate that to the tech that Riz is talking about when, you literally have your own reality projected in front of you as you walk in AR in the short term and then possibly what? don't. So you like as you walk, you're seeing like maybe Yelp reviews and but also, you know, maybe you in your you want to see everybody naked or what you know what I mean? That's what Johnny, you're Johnny, I'm working on my addictions. I don't want that anymore. But but, but. think about that though, how you could it, you everybody has their own reality based on what is being projected into 100 their hundred percent onto their yeah. eyes. That yeah. is that is another danger of this, that we're no longer I, I kind of came to this in stand up where it's like, I'm gonna record this edgy stuff, put it out maybe just on my website, so those who want it want it, and then kind of re rework how I do stand up because I think there was a time where people like political comedy because they got their politics one hour a week on the or one hour night in the news and maybe on the newspaper, but they could put down the newspaper, they could turn off the television and they wouldn't be bombarded. Now with the internet and our phones everywhere, we're constantly bombarded with this, with yeah. this, oh, you know, doomsday 
scrolling. That's and going- the good news is you'll be able to filter yeah. it out though. But think about trying to do comedy for, and this is bordering on Black Mirror territory. But trying we to do, are in Black Mirror. Trying to do comedy for yeah. people who have filtered out controversial topics. You know, it just in the, in the, in their input. You know, yeah. So think about that. You, they just won't hear it. They'll just be like, a, that's why sh- everything's gonna get to the, uh, just simple. It's just all gonna be simple because that's the only thing that people. Will be into it is it is also yeah. infinite jest though right it's like it, it, you know it's seductive if you recall that book by David Foster Wallace it's something that's so seductive that it will be irresistible once you've once you've experienced it I think uh, you know it could end well, your your reality you know your well, life I as mean you people know it. talk about like convenience is going to be you know our our downfall people will always go to the most convenient thing and then that gets us in the weird places whether it's digital currency. Yeah. And all that stuff to just the easier it is, the more we flock to it. And it's just the way it is. So I, I don't know what the answer is. I, I get very nervous. My children are three years old. Like, what world will they? And we lost them. Did we lose them? Hey, guys, real quick, I want to tell you about our friends at Black Buffalo. That's right. If you're over 21 and dip or chew, pouchless or long cut, check out the award winning tobacco alternative, Black Buffalo. Black Buffalo is everything you love, nothing you don't. The feel, the taste, the ritual, just without act- the actual tobacco leaf or stem. Black Buffalo is actually made from a variety of green leaves in the cabbage family. You take pride in what you do, take pride in your dip. Honor your rituals with Black Buffalo. Black Buffalo makes. All the best flavors like wintergreen, mint, straight, peach, even blood orange. Blood orange in, blood orange out, okay? With with or without pharmaceutical grade nicotine. Bang, right? You can buy Black Buffalo online at blackbuffalo.com. Use the promo code TINFOIL. TINFOIL. Or at thousands of retail locations across the country by checking out their, their store locator on the web. Okay? Just real quick, real easy, real fun. Okay? I love Black Buffalo. I love C. I, sometimes when I go on the road, bang, look at it. They're, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. You, all over LA. You need go it, get them. You em. get it. Okay? Black Buffalo. Not giving you what you want. Give you what you need. Okay? Go to Black Buffalo. Dot com. Use the promo code TINFOIL oh. at checkout and make it happen. So this is real simple. Go to If you're over 21 and you use the products like this, it's time to join Black Buffalo Herd. Head to blackbuffalo.com. Use the promo code TINFOIL at checkout for 50% off your first order. Use my code, my code, TINFOIL for 50% off your first order. One last time. That's promo code TINFOIL. For fifteen percent off your order. Wow, we we were getting too close. Oh, it's, just, close. it's Zoom. Oh, there he is. Okay. Oh, it's sorry. 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 with Zoom. Uh, yeah, I was Zoom the only one in the meeting for a second. Yeah, yeah we're and we're back. Uh yeah, man. It, the, the the there is so much to this. What does it open? What does it? And then there will be a group of people. And and, and, and Riz, I want to ask you this: Do you think it is possible to unplug from all this? Do you think they will get to a point where it will be impossible to unplug? Because I'm slowly weaning off social media. You're you're seeing me post yep. way less. I'm very rarely on Twitter now, unless it's. A, I just put it on my phone because I had to ask a question. I'm going to take it back off. But do yep. you do you think there will be a time where you will be unable to d- unplug? Because you saw this during COVID, like a 90 year old grandmother couldn't get on a bus because she didn't have her like her vaccine pass on her phone and she just like i don't own a phone i'm 90 something years old i don't need a cell phone well, and then, I, ids are going to phones now i mean get ready no for that. i'm with that like do you yeah. do you see that as something in the future where even if you want to unplug you won't be able to yeah well first of all i agree that social media is becoming more and more toxic and you know the funny thing is Check this out, right? I haven't actually bought a physical newspaper <laughs> in like at least a, a couple of decades, right? Probably since the 90s, right? And I bought one recently just so I could sit outside and not be like doom scrolling on my phone <laughs> and actually read long form articles. I love the know? newspaper. I love, I miss the newspaper, picking it up so, and just going through it. Yeah. So do I. And I started to go through page by page. And there were a lot of stories that, you know, the algorithms would never show to me. 
on Twitter or X or, you know, on Facebook or wherever, or even if I was in the New York Times app, I wouldn't bother going through all of these pages, but because I had the physical copy with me, you know, I went through and was reading about all kinds of interesting stuff like I used to back in the day. But, you know, that, that's for those of us who actually remember that time, <laughs> right, before, uh, you know, when we were all kind of unplugged, right? But with the younger generation, I mean, they spend as much time as avatars in video games and online and within TikTok. I, I think it's going to get more difficult uh, to your, your, your question and, and, you know, with the vaccine passes, I mean, that was like, I think, an interesting trial run, right? Because if you just think about it from a technology perspective, right, uh, just looking at it purely as a technocratic society. And that's, I think, you know, one of the issues here is that we saw science and technology have become so dominant in our culture that then they start to dictate the policies and you don't necessarily have the freedom to do anything anymore. It makes sense to put all this information somewhere, like in a database on the server to be accessed from your phone. Today, everybody has a phone. So many people have smartwatches. And this is why, you know, I'm one of the few technologists who think this idea of the microchip is not a conspiracy. I think if you look at what happened during COVID, that, you know, you'll start to get to the point where people will, will be demanding that you have a little chip that has a track of your vaccinations oh and your drugs God. and all of these things. and and they'll make it purely from a you know technological and administrative and efficiency perspective and and you will end up in a in a place like Gattaca right if you remember in Gattaca they had to like scan they had to give a little blood or something and or scan their DNA and it would come back with you are valid or you are invalid so oh i'm just saying my. purely Purely as a technologist, you saw that happening. Now, there's a bit of bit backlash now going on. So, you know, people are easing off of those restrictions now. But you saw how quickly things can erupt again and everybody goes crazy again. You're and totally if that right. happens, you know, that's what the, the Silicon Valley guys combined. So, you know, my PhD is in this idea of science and technology studies, which is that science and technology and society and power are not separate, right? They're, they're kind of co co-produced together. Uh, and in some ways, you know, science fiction gives us these visions of what might be there and it influences the way that we think about these things, you know, like with The Walking Dead, right? You got people that are infected. They're, they're so bad that you can shoot them, right? And, and you saw people like Howard Stern and other people talking about during COVID, uh, you know, let the unvaccinated die, right? Let them stay at home. Don't give them any medical attention. How quickly. Yeah. <laughs> but it's because they have this image in their mind of this killer virus. And where did that come from? Well, it came from science fiction, right? Or you have a show You're like so Outbreak. You're so right. You're yeah. so right. Do you remember the movie Outbreak? Yeah. It was the outbreak of a killer disease. And then, of course, on TV and in science fiction all the time, the scientists jump in. They, you know, manufacture the antidote. They give it to everybody. Nobody has any side effects. Yeah. Everything is great. <laughs> Nobody falls dead from yeah. thinking that. Right? You're so <laughs> right. It's all predictive programming. They're yeah. just trying to, pro which gets into something. I didn't know how deep you wanted to go on that, but, you know, I I, I think a lot of stuff in the world, is, and we'll get into the, I want to get into your book because I, I, I'm excited to talk to you about that. Uh, you know, I, again, I, I look at everything happening in the world from a spiritual perspective. I think the masters of mankind have all the money and all the power they could, they shut down the world. That should let you know how much power they have. They shut the world down and just to see how we would react. Um, what I get really nervous about, and it goes back to what Johnny, what you brought up about the projection of your reality in front of you. It's like once we start to get away from what is real, what is not real, okay? Consensus reality, let's call it, right? Let, yeah. I mean, that's going to become a real term, consensus reality. What is, and, and I'll be 70 when that's something going, you young whippersnappers are talking crazy, you know? like, And I get worried that when my as my generation ages out, that, that a lot of the stuff that we're worried about, the 1984 part of the world, might start to disappear because this younger generation isn't necessarily, they grew up with the internet. Like I'm the last generation that remembers a time without the internet and what that was like. So we, you know, my kids are fully, they got pads all the time. You take the pads away, they go nuts. And you're like, well, they don't want, uh, you know, if I don't, they, having the pads a bad idea, but if they don't have the pad, that's a bad idea as well. Anyways, the point is, is that the ability to inflict mass psychosis 
and mass trauma on like a, a not you know not to get too dark, but like a nine eleven type event in this simulation that scares me that they're going to be able to do things like that to elicit more responses and stuff is something you really have to ask yourself again. Consensus reality is a wonderful way to put it. Like how are we going to, and then what does that do to us as a species? Do, do the people, and this is a great question I have for you is, is like what happens to the alphas of our world? The, the, the cross, the, the uh, CrossFit people who are in this material world that have these genetic build to, to be physically superior. What what happens to those people when when suddenly now a lot of stuff moves into this simulation? What are your th thoughts on everything I talked about? Well, that's a lot of stuff. But I'm sorry, you know, I think man. It, 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 no, it's good. So if you think of, uh, I like to draw this distinction between the hard simulation hypothesis and what some people call the soft simulation or the narrative. Uh, you know, matrix, or even what you might call consensus reality. So in the hard simulation hypothesis, the idea is that we are physically in a computer simulation. And uh, there's two versions of that. There's what I call the NPC version and the RPG version. And in the NPC version, we're all inside uh, the simulation as AI, basically. And if the simulation gets shut down, it gets shut down. Uh, and I think we talked a little bit about this last time with multiple timelines and you can rerun the simulation again. And Philip K. Dick talked about this back, all the way back in 1977. Uh, then there's the RPG version, which is where we are avatars inside the simulation, but we exist outside. And that's where the link to the spiritual side really comes into play, which is that, the you know, if you look at what the ancient traditions have been telling us, they've been telling us that the whole world is Maya or illusion, Right. And that we're here for a period of time, whether it's the Bible, the Quran, the Vedas. Right. They're all saying something similar, that this is not real uh, and that there is something beyond that, whether you call it the hereafter, the Bardo in Buddhism uh, or heaven this. or hell or whatever else. Right. And so it, this is a kind of game. And if you remember in The Matrix, um, it, in the the in the sequels, they, they reveal that the first version of The Matrix had like no problems. Yeah, you know, everything yeah. was great, right? But the human mind didn't accept it. Yeah. So getting back to how immersed do you want to be in the game, and then you forget what is real. Uh, now that touches on kind of when when within this physical universe we are able to project. Like for example, the painting behind me, is it really there or not? Uh, first of all, I'm not really talking to you, am I? I'm talking to my computer. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, so right, dude. Oh. That's so crazy. <laughs> and so I how in. can you? How can you tell that painting is really there or not, right? Because Zoom can change the background already. So, so already we're starting to see this idea of the, what's real and what's not real in our interactions. But if you take the simulation hypothesis seriously, we're all rendering the world on our own computers. So it's very possible we're all seeing something yep. slightly yep. different from each other, right? And so that brings up this idea that that you know what is consensus reality and how much are we allowed to to see but i do think that as ar gets better you know we'll be able to see different things and there's a lot of great science fiction about this idea there's a book called rainbow's end uh which uh mark zuckerberg you know lists as part of his inspiration inspiration for the metaverse where you know they've got like contact lenses and wearables and basically you can project that you're in a castle when you're actually just in a library but it can look like a medieval castles library or something like that uh, because of it being tied in. I don't remember if it was with contact lenses or how they did it. But that technology is coming. So now we're, we're, we're starting to see that if people can restrict what you see in that world, they can, in fact, influence your behavior. And we used to do that. Like, there used to be only the three uh, networks, right? For those of us who are old enough to remember, <laughs> you know, back to even before cable TV, right? It was just uh, yeah, the, the news, the, the, and that's where you got your news. So what they said, whether it was the Gulf of Tonkin and Vietnam or whatever, you know, whatever news, that's all it was. Now we're at the point where we almost have too many different perspectives with social media. Yes, but <laughs> yeah, uh, but it's crazy. Yeah, it, it's good. It is getting crazy. But but the point is, within a game, uh, you know, uh, Nolan Bushnell, who was the founder of Atari, which is kind of the grandfather of the video game industry, and. I played Atari as a kid. I used to play Space Invaders and Pac-Man on my little 2600 at home. But, you know, he said the secret to a good game was 
uh, to make it easy to play, but difficult to master. Right. And that's pretty good description of life. Like it's, it's pretty easy to play, but it's hard to master and you have to have challenges and challenges are on difficulty levels. Right. And so if we're going to run a simulation or have a game, why do we play video games? One, we play them to have different experiences than we can have in the physical world. Um, perhaps murder and mayhem are part of that. I don't know. I don't think that's the purpose of this game. Right. But that is one of the reasons why we do. And then why do we run simulations? We run simulations to see what will be the outcome. Like if I change this variable, you know, will, will there be a world war three? Will we destroy ourselves? Will we get off the planet? Right. Will, will we destroy the planet? Right. There are all these different things. But when you run a simulation, you always run more than one. And I, I think we talked a little bit about the Mandela effect last time, but that's where you get into this idea that there may be more than one reality. There may be not just one part possible future, there may be multiple possible pasts as well that were previous runs of the simulation. And some of us remember, and it gets manifested as this weird thing like the Mandela effect where some people remember Mandela dying in prison and other people, you know, or Bob Barker dying all the time. And then suddenly he died again. It's kind of crazy. So uh, before we get into your book, um, because I do want, because I am on a very spiritual journey right now. So I'm excited to talk to you. Uh, I want to. You, you, yeah, one of the talking points you brought up that I'm really excited about is like, what is the difference between an NPC and an RPG, and what is an RPG? Real player. Sure. Right. Well, it's really a role playing game. Okay. RPG is what it stands for. And so, in that, in the RPG version, we have an avatar inside the game, just like we do in a regular video game, like World of Warcraft or something. You're the player. You exist outside the game, and then you've got your uh, player character inside the game. Now, some people talk about terminology, like simulation theory has become kind of a meme religion, right? People talk about the simulators and NPCs all the time, uh, but they sometimes use the term source player versus an NPC, right? Which is somebody who's maybe just being controlled by the code. Uh, and, and I always encourage people to not, don't assume anybody else is an NPC. Assume everybody else is a role-playing character, just like you are, right? Who is playing the game. Uh, I had a woman say to me once, I think my husband is an NBC, NPC. I said, well, <laughs> that's probably not a good assumption to make. Nope, right? nope, nope. <laughs> he ignores you too much. I wonder if you can switch in and out, meaning like, you know, Ooh. I'll be driving and I'll see somebody, and they'll literally walk like a hooker in Grand Theft Auto, the way that the that's way so they funny. walk down the street. Right. I recorded a guy the other day looking like. Are you familiar with clipping and in, in, in like computer programming, uh, like in games? It's where things get kind of stuck in walls yeah. and stuff. It's called yeah. clipping. Right. Like, and and I saw a guy that was just walking in like with his head against the wall. It was so no, strange. I'm, I'm I seen that it. too. Yeah. At the airport all the time. I'm like, why is that person walking to the wall like that? So, but what if in this weird giant simulation that is beyond our understanding, what if like, you know, we're all talking to each other, so we're all role players, but what if in somebody else? We hope we are anyway. We are, we are NPCs in their simulation. Right. And this is where it gets kind of complicated. So there's, these two are not mutually exclusive, right? Uh, so you don't have a simulation that only has source players and avatars, uh, or you could have one that's only NPCs, but most of our video games have both. Now, this is why I like the, the 13th floor, because in that, the characters are NPCs in, in say, the, the 1937 version of L.A., but then the player can come in and inhabit them, right? So we can have moments where we're more connected with the player in the past. So I think that that's an interesting perspective is that we, we have sort of an NPC mode, kind of a Sims mode, right? If you, if you play the Sims, you see the Sims are doing their little things, right? They're kind of like pre-programmed uh, and you have some control over it, but you're not like necessarily controlling every single movement in the same way you might like when you're fighting a battle right. uh, with an avatar, right? In fact, the term avatar is a Sanskrit word. It was the guys at yeah. Lucasfilm they were making a video game back in ninth, late 1980s called Habitat. It's really the first MMORPG. And they they had this little, you know, two, eight-bit character that was representing you, and they're looking for a word. They said, well, I feel like I'm kind of taking myself, which is this big thing, and I'm going down in the telephone wires. They were using, like, modems on Commodore 64, right? And I'm beaming myself into this little, little thing. 
Uh, and so they called it an avatar because the Sanskrit word means when divinity, which is, you know, very big, comes down into a human body. Uh, and that's kind of how we can think of ourselves if we're playing uh, the game of life, is that there may be a bigger part of us. And this is where the interface is into the spiritual side, you know. Can yeah, I, I, get related to that, I would love to know what you, because I can think of a few, like information gathering, entertainment. Uh, what, what would be some of the motivations for some some someone in the in the higher reality, let's call it, to create this simulation that you can think of. Well, so people always ask me this question, like, what's outside the simulation, right? And uh, if you remember on one of uh, one of Lex's podcasts, uh, he, he asked Elon Musk, "What would you ask super intelligent AI?" And he said, "What's outside the simulation?" Right? And I think it depends a little bit on your perspective, right? In an ancestor simulation, it's a future version of us. Right. Uh, like, like if we were building a version of ancient Rome, uh, it could be aliens, could be, I think it's a more spiritual perspective. I think it's us in the sense that, you know, I think there is an RPG element to the simulation. I don't think we're all just AI in the simulation. I feel like we choose to come in, uh, in, in and we choose to play a character, right? There's a, there's a great episode of Rick and Morty, if you guys mm-hmm. have seen it. Uh, which has a, a game called Roy, a life well lived. It's like a virtual reality game. And, you know, he goes in there and suddenly he's a little baby and he forgets that he was outside the simulation. He crosses what, what the Greeks call the river of forgetfulness. And this is what got, got me thinking about the simulation in the first place was with VR. If you forget, he's a little baby, he goes to school, right? He graduates from high school. <laughs> he marries his high school sweetheart. He has kids. He's up to like 50 years old and he's, putting something on a big shelf and he, you know, falls over and dies. Uh, and then it says game over. You live to age 52 or whatever. Right. <laughs> sounds like Ari and, Salvia. Trip. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly what it sounds <laughs> like. Crazy. Yeah. So, and then he goes, wait, where's my wife? Where's my kids? What's going on? And only 15 minutes have passed outside the simulation. That's <laughs> so crazy. That thought that's and, so- and that ties to the spiritual side too, because they tell us, what we think of as time doesn't exist. And inside a simulation, you know, the, the time is based on the clock speed, right? You can have a simulation of multiple years that have runs in five minutes, right? Um, and yeah. like right now, I'm using Zoom talking to you, but there's another process running, let's say, Microsoft Word. And when I go back to it, it doesn't realize that time has stopped. It just picks up from where it left off when I was last there. So time inside the simulation is different. It's kind outside. of like... When you visit somewhere often and then you leave and then you come right back to it, like La Jolla, when I used to go, it was such a weird feeling because I feel like it just picked back up when I walked in. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I know exactly what you're saying. It's like this weird, like, are they still going? There's a, there's a very uh, primitive version of what I was talking about earlier in a Google, you know, Google earth has a VR app where you can visit different places around. And I went back home in Google Earth, uh, and the scan from that time was 2019 when my grandmother was still alive. So I went by her house and Aww. her cars in the yard, you know what I mean? Aww. And it's just, I mean, right. I, I'm thinking about how... Johnny, if you cry right now, I'm we'll not, give more cry. ratings. <laughs> I, uh, but you get what I'm saying? Like, yeah. think about that. That's kind of what you're talking about, but yeah. it extrapolated to what it's going to be like when everything has been in, scanned into yeah, you know, it's a, gonna a hard drive. Yeah, it's going to be nuts. So you brought up some in, a, a real big thing that I'm into is like taking a look at all these different spiritual philosophies, these different religions, trying to find the common thing in all of it. Like, what are the things that they're all saying? Because that to me is, is would say, okay, maybe there's some truth to that. Because again, we don't know what is real. We, I, I feel like. Israel? This desire, <laughs> this desire to find the truth and nothing but the truth, I think can make you go mad. I think you'll go crazy trying to figure out, oh man, well, you know, I believe this. Well, you know, like these people mess with that and change that Old Testament, New Testament. And then what do the Hindus think that we're around forever before this religion came? I like, you'll go mad. I think you'll go mad. You need to have a grip to get into this stuff. You just kind of got to go what feels right, what doesn't feel right. I think your soul kind of tries to help you to understand that. But I love that all the stuff you're bringing up, this kind of, talk about simulations across all these different disciplines and beliefs so which will lead us to your books what are your thoughts on all that 
Yeah, well, I think, you know, you you hit the nail on the head, and that's one of the things that really uh, drew me towards simulation theory is, first of all, it's a connective bridge between science and religion, right? Because if you think, you know, 500 years ago in the time of Galileo, uh, the church was the dominant paradigm for how we thought in society. And they were kind of prosecuting the scientists and trying to hide things from them or saying, that's not real, that can't be real, because that's not what our doctrine says. Now, 500 years later, we've gone the opposite direction, yes. where science is the dominant paradigm. And so anything with religion, nobody in academia, you know, takes seriously. They say, yeah, yeah, those are just stories. That's not reality. Let's look at physics. Let's look at chemistry, right? Uh, and so they tend to dismiss it. But with simulation theory, you can actually talk about things like we're talking about today, which is what's outside the simulation, right? There was a British philosopher uh, named David Pierce, I think, who said that uh, the simulation argument, he was talking about Bostrom simulation argument, is the probably the first, you know, interesting argument for a creator in the last 2,000 years, right? And so I can talk with professors at MIT about uh, the simulation hypothesis and how things could be rendered and how that might change our reality. So earlier, was it Johnny mentioned clipping, right, when you're kind of in the walls? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and and this ties to things like UFOs, right? So if you go go to reports of UFOs, I interviewed uh, you know Jacques Vallée, uh, you know who's been researching UFOs since Project Blue Book back in the day, and he said there were instances where you know one person saw the UFO and the person standing next to them didn't, right? Which meant that they were kind of being rendered for the person in the same way That's that so interesting. You know, I might see a UFO or an alien behind you because you put it there on the Zoom and your Zoom background, right? But everybody else might not see it. And that's what we do in video games. We let level 30 players have different rules for what they render than level two players. You're so right. Players. That's so right. And it also gets down to like when we had um, those guys on from Reality Czars, they were talking about how like, what you see may be determined by what you believe. So, right, like if you, if you, let's say you're atheist, you're more likely to see aliens. If you're religious, you're more likely to see uh, demons or stuff like that. Like you, different people see different things. It's like if you don't believe in Bigfoot, you'll never see Bigfoot. If you just don't believe the, the possibilities of something like that happening. And it just gets into modern day politics like if you see hillary clinton and this is not to get political or anything but if you see hillary clinton as uh your a grandma and just uh you know who bakes pies you can't possibly see that she might do all this if you see her as this very dark entity you could totally see her doing all those things and the even more concerning thing about that is that you're going to see everybody else who sees her that way as some kind of other you know yes. and it's going to be easy to be manipulated against them Again, yeah, it gets into also the uh, the law of duality, right? The light and the dark. Like, if you see somebody as light, you see them as a good person. If you see somebody as dark, you uh, in the darkness, you see them as a bad person. In it, a weird way, would you call it manifesting it? No, in because I mean, most people like it is a weird way of manifestation, but because I mean, I mean, we we've seen the people that get, uh, I mean, you've seen the people females or stuff that get possessed in movies. They believe in Jesus Christ and the devil. Usually, it's what happens, and then. Because it's not real atheists that come out saying they're they're possessed. Yeah, that's interesting. So you think it's manifesting it in a or way? Or is that like an Elgor? Or Elgor? Is that what an that? Egregor. Egregor? Is that what that might be too? Like you, I think that was, I think that's when like a a, a, a group of people. Of people yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. It, yeah. Again, I my whole opinion is there, and this kid I think fits into. Uh, simulation there is no reality there's only perception and what you perceive becomes your reality and if you see it like that right if you see that doom is here it's like the guy that lives in arizona that has guns everywhere and like he was like on this doomsday show on like nat geo or something like that like every part of his house there is a gun because he is convinced that day is coming to the point where it's like on the show his wife dies from a confetti gun like somebody was telling me the other day, so oh, it, confetti again? It, yeah, what somehow you, it scared her. Or something? Yeah, or something. Oh. Anyways, the whole point is that you are you, 
What you see is what you what you perceive is becomes your reality. It's that old saying: when, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. One hundred percent. Hey guys, real quick, I want to tell you about a couple things you can find on the website samtriplee.com. It's everything you need: audio, video, all there of all my podcasts across the board. You can also get my dates there. You can also get T-shirts there. We are adding T-shirts all the time. We just added a uh, more DSing, less bombing. I love that one. Okay, you. We we also got uh, Yahweh or the Highway new shirts Woo! are there. They should be up. It's a great way to support the show. Grab your t-shirts now. I got more magic coming. I also have a uh, mental gymnastics one everyone's going to really like. Listen, if you want to support the show, rockfin.com. $15 you get all my shows across all the boards. We also have Cash Daddies, uh, patreon.com slash Cash Daddies. Great way to make money in these difficult markets. We also have some affiliates. I'm going to hit them out real quick. Uh, if you're looking for gold and silver, a great way to go to Wise Wolf. Click the banner. Uh, brown Hydrogen brown gas. Everyone loves it. Harley Ray, our good friends in Candles and Crystals. You can get a, use the promo code SWARM15. Click that one. And Tim James, who was just on the show, universally loved. You can get a discount on all of his stuff on his website, Chemical Free Body. And then finally, Joel Staley, who's going to help me lose weight and get ready to rock. All those there. Click the banners. Support them. Support us. It's a great way. And all my audio, all my video again. Help us help you. Help us help you. We, we totally, you know, do in that sense. We filter our reality through that, right? I mean, there was a there was a really interesting book by a Harvard professor that was made in a movie called The Serpent and the Rainbow. And he talked about when he was in, in Haiti and they had given people this zombie powder and they died and then they woke back up and they thought they were zombies, right? But it turns out the powder was actually capable of, you know, making your, your heart rate and everything go to the point where it looked like you were dead. But they actually believed they were zombies that were summoned back because that was part of their belief system, right? And so they didn't think they were like real people anymore. And so you can see how the belief systems affect it. But with the simulation, we're going even further and saying physically, we may actually be rendering something, you know, that's, that's very different. Um, for each of us. Now, I think getting back to your original question about the religions. Uh, so the other thing that drew me to simulation theory was that it does provide this common layer. Like I think of uh, traveler reports, right? People who feel like they have peaked outside of physical reality, whether it's the yogis or it's the founders of various religions uh, or like in the Islamic traditions, you have, they call them peers or you have monks uh, and you have all these stories of things that they've done. Uh, but basically, if they're like traveler reports, if you're hearing these stories, you know, if you if you hear like a thousand people said that they've been to China and several of them tell you about, you know, this pagoda shaped buildings, you can have a pretty good sense that 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 is a real thing that's actually there. And so that's why with simulation theory, I think it provides that that common layer. I mean, I'm a computer scientist, so I think of like classes and instances of objects and what are the things that are in common between them. And one of them is that the physical world is not real. The second thing is that things do get recorded and get reviewed just like they would in a video game, right? Hey. Uh, and so, you know, in YouTube, guess what? what's the most popular content on YouTube? What do like you think it is? Oh dear! Uh, reaction videos, maybe I don't know. <laughs> that, like what Sam usually says, crime like, videos. Ch children yeah. opening up toys. Those say, I mean, those kids. It's so hard to say I because I know that. mine is different than yours. You know, my my. Well, he's saying was the most popular. I what know, but is what I'm saying? I, I feel like I, I don't know that. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. So the the group that's the most popular, at least it was when I last looked, is actually watching video game sessions, right? It's actually watching people oh, playing video games. So kind of like Twitch, like you know, my nephew when he was like three or four years old, right? He couldn't read or write. He's like telling my his father, my brother, he's saying, I want to watch Star Wars. He's oh, you want to watch the movie? No, no, I want to watch that man and that woman play the Star Wars video game, right? Which was like- Yeah, my <laughs> kids love watching people play with toys. It's so weird. Yeah. And, and you're willing it's, to buy, and I know you're willing to buy them and they'd rather watch someone else playing like my- They don't want to watch anything else. They just want to watch people play with toys. Okay, and do you, it's so okay, creepy. You know how we make fun of them and we're like, that's so dumb. Why don't you go and play that? You think that's the same thing with sports and poker? I watch poker all well, the time. Oh yeah, good point. And point, I'm, Once in a while, Xavier <laughs> Guerrero knocks it out of the park. That's like, a great point. That's a, a wonderful point. Yeah, like I was making fun of my, my, my cousin. He's like, why are you watching these kids play? He's like, why do you watch people play poker? And I was like, 
fuck, dude. Yeah. Like, yeah. you're yeah. kind of right. And yeah. then I was like, well, why does Sam watch people yeah. play football? You're totally right. And we're roasting these kids when we do the exact same you're, thing. And we it is not, a little different for the children, though, because those are things that kids could potentially do. Like, for Sam, there's just no not chance of him playing the NFL. Dude, no, you didn't but, see no. me last night in jiu-jitsu. I but was he, a marvel. But he can play in a, an adult's <laughs> league. But he can't play in an adult's league. But right. just, you, is that maybe it's because they're not no, as good. No, it's interesting. It's, well, it's like, why do people watch The View? Because we like to watch people talk. It's Thank God. I mean, that's why this show is where it is, and it's doing so well. Because people yeah. like us... Having these kind of conversations. Yeah, but I wouldn't say we're the NFL of conversations. You know what I mean? We're not. No, we're not. <laughs> that would be the, that'd be the Joe Rogan. But we're like, you know what I'm saying? Though? Like, I feel like the NFL is like the peak. Are we like, right, like right, that right, because right, that's right. humanity at its f- physical best. Are we you know w? what I mean? Are we but, WNBA? but I think people like to hear conversations. No, we're, because we're, the, we're the cornhole. What is people that? People feel like they're the fifth person in the room. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. It's mm. it, it's interesting. But yeah, man, you're totally right. People love to watch. Like Johnny on our other podcast played. They showed us the video of the guy who's playing the uh, the meta, and it was like fun to watch him. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That that. Half Life Alex uh, mod I was telling you about. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so it's interesting for sure. I, I totally agree. Yeah. So, what what what's what were you trying to say by bringing that up? Is that we like to yeah. watch people play video games? Yeah. So within a video game, you can record the whole three D world, right? And you can play it back. And uh, you know, I was involved in a startup a few years ago where you could take like League of Legends, for example, right? Or Counter-Strike Global Offensive, CSGO, which is a first-person shooter. And you could replay it from any XYZ coordinate. So you could see what it was like yeah. to have what? been that other player. Yeah. And you could basically see what it was like to shoot yourself. Now, how does this relate to the whole religion thing? Okay, so this is one of the other things that the religion seemed to agree upon, which is that everything is being recorded and you can play it back and you can watch it. And this is something that near-death experiencers yes, yes. report, right? They report something called a life review. And there was a guy named Daniel Brinkley. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's a, he wrote a book called Saved by the Light. He was struck by lightning back in the 70s. It was a huge, his book is a huge bestseller in the 90s. And I, I first learned about this life review from him. And he called it a holographic panoramic life review, where you had to revisit every single moment in your life. But you had to view it from the other person's yes, perspective. Yes, dude, yes. And you had to feel what they were feeling. And he literally... He was in the military and he literally shot and killed people. So he had to see what it was like to shoot himself. But then he had to see what happened to that guy's family, his wife and kids after he was shot. And this is what's called the ripple effects. Now, now let's go back to the religions. So in, in, in uh, Washington, DC, there's a picture, uh, there's a statue of an angel with a book called, uh, and they call it a recording angel. Uh, And in the Bible, they talk about the recording angel where you record who's getting into heaven and who's not, or, uh, in, in the Quran, they get into this in much more detail. They say there's something called a scroll of deeds where you have two angels, right? You've probably seen the little caricature yeah. of the good angel and yeah. the bad angel. Yeah. That comes from the Islamic traditions. And they said there's an angel that writes down all your good deeds. And then there's an angel that writes down all your bad deeds. And they're the recording angels. And then at the end, judgment day isn't about God judging you. It's about opening you a book and reading what the heck you did and what happened because of that. Well, those are metaphors, right? All the religions were, you know, founded hundreds or thousands of years ago. And it doesn't mean there's physically angels with wings with feather pens writing down, you know, in what language? English, Chinese. What it means is that everything is being recorded and you can replay it in like a holographic virtual reality. Uh, everything that happened. And it's so it, it, we need to update the metaphors from these religions. And that's one of the reasons why I like simulation theory when it comes to spirituality, because it gives us a way to understand the thing that science may have dismissed. Ah, that's not, that doesn't happen. That's all bullshit, right? Those are just interesting stories, right? But it gives us a way to think about it and say, oh, you know what? They might have been right, but they were trying to use this old outdated language and they were stuck in this culture of 2000 years ago. If, if they were founded today, you know, they would call it X, Y, or Z. And so I think simulation theory is the best kind of updated metaphor for that kind of thing. I, I'm i totally into uh, near-death experiences and all that stuff. And I'm, I just, I, you know, again, it's like I'm on the spiritual journey, new information coming in. How does it, how does it connect with the what, my old beliefs? And I'm just not somebody who wants to throw out all, everything. And just start anew with this new belief. I, I, I just think it's 
I'm just so like again. I think you'll go crazy if you try to like. I gotta get the the, the right answer to everything, and it's got to be a feel. And I do believe in energy, and I do. I I, I think Abrahamic religions and simulation can find a connection. There could be some common ground and find some stuff in there. I just believe it. I just do believe it because it all makes sense to me. So let's talk about your book, Lessons for a Modern uh, uh, Wisdom of a Yogi. Lessons for a Modern Seeker uh, from the Autobiography of, of a Yogi. Tell us a little bit about this and why you wrote this book. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, sometimes we have episodes in our life that plant seeds and we're not always certain, you know, what's going to happen to that. And that's kind of what happened with, with this book was uh, I had some health issues and I was sitting on the couch and I decided to reread Autobiography of a Yogi, which is kind of a famous book. Uh, by a guy named Paramhansa Yogananda, who was a Swami from India. He came over to the U.S. back in 1920, came to Boston to give a lecture on yoga and kind of the Eastern religions. And he was, he's was he been called the first modern yogi by, by scholars, uh, because uh, the first modern guru, because he actually lived in America. He taught crisscross the country and, and was teaching about these Eastern traditions, but he was also bridging the gap between you know the primarily Christian population in the West, so he talked about the Bible a lot, as well as uh, you know things like karma, things like meditation. Uh, I mean, today we're used to thinking of yoga as the physical postures, and there's yoga you know studios everywhere. But a lot of that came about because in the '60s, during the counterculture, you know his book was one of the most passed around books. Uh, so like George Harrison, for example, from the Beatles, he used to have copies of this book and he used to give it out to everybody. Uh, and Steve Jobs, he went all the way to India to look for spirituality and he ended up finding a copy of Autobiography of the Yogi and he ended up reading it every year. And at his funeral, you know, he gave away, uh, or his memorial service after his funeral, he gave, he gave everybody, he made arrangements because he was, he had passed away, obviously, but everybody received a little brown box. And in that was a copy of Autobiography of a Yogi. And so this is a book that has stories of yogis doing crazy things, yogis that are levitating in the air, oh. yogis that are bilocating. You've got like, entities like jinn making objects appear and disappear you've got palaces being materialized and dematerialized in front of his, his face and he's telling all these crazy stories and they're very memorable it made the book a bestseller but so i i reread it and wrote some articles about uh, about him and about the book but i never meant to write a book about it and then a couple of years later uh, on the 75th anniversary harper collins india reached out to me and said, you know, we like all this stuff you've been doing with modern technology and religion. Uh, we'd like you to write a book about lessons from ancient yogis, you know, using the autobiography of a yogi story, all these crazy stories of these yogis, uh, and and tell us, you know, what you've learned from it and what should we think today. And so that's how I ended up writing this book, which was, you know, are these lessons still relevant today? And, you know, one of the lessons is sometimes the universe gives you a task uh, that you weren't necessarily – uh, preparing for you may not even know you're fully ready for but it puts the task in your lap and it's your task to do and and that was the case with this and that was the case with yogananda when he came over to america he was a 20 something swami who had never given a lecture in english ever like he had only finished college because his guru made him do it and yet he ended up you know teaching millions of people in the U.S. through his books and through his travels and talks, uh, even though he wasn't necessarily ready for it. And sometimes that happens to us in life. So that's kind of the story of how I came to write this book. I love it. And, I, you know, it's it's this whole thing that on the spiritual journey that I'm in recovery. And, you know, the thing I've learned is that, you know, the universe warns you and then it shows you. And then if it doesn't and if, if things don't work out the way you wanted to is because better things are coming and that was not meant part of to be part of your journey. And some people get really sad or depressed because it didn't go the way they want to. But I always go, well, that's not meant to be your journey. You're not meant to do that. Something else is coming. And that can be a hard place to get to. So, you know, this guy didn't even want to go to college. You know, now he's showing up. I mean, at 20 years old too. I mean, look at the way our 20 year olds are raised now. You know, and now this guy's giving lectures and it changes the world. You know, we all really want to have that impact, right? We really want to have the impact where we change the world like that. But sometimes our destiny is just to change ourselves and, yeah. and, to, and to work in a, in a way that 
we are an example for others to follow. And I think that's very important. And like, you know, it's like I, I, I really do believe, man, that we can manipulate energy. I know people get really upset about that, that, are, you know, Christians that listen to the show. And I, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I really do believe that you can manipulate energy through multiple disciplines, whether it's, uh, you know, law of attraction, law of abundance, all that stuff. Everyone tries to say that's a trick being played, but I don't know, man. It's just like... Who, who, who's been saying that? That's well, I, I, people say that's like a trick. That I mean, the, the the dark ones try to run a, on you. Is it a prayer? Is it prayers kind of way? That's of another doing thing. That? that that's why I believe too. It's like if you believe it, you can you can will things to happen. If I tell people, write down your list of things that you want to do in your life, and just keep writing them down and keep putting energy into them, and you'll be amazed at how many of those you end up doing. You, you know how dumb it sounds. Do a to do list. Shake it's done. Yeah. Make a to-do list. And it's almost it, like if you yeah. visualize it, it yeah. happens. Yeah. Yeah. Tell yourself you're not going to do yeah. anything on that to-do. Uh, you're not going to take a nap till you do everything on to-do list. That's what gets done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's true. I, I think that's true. But at the same time, I think there are certain things that we are drawn to more than others. And, and like you were saying earlier, sometimes it's a part of our path and certain other things aren't. So like when Yogananda was eight years old, you know, he he saw an image of these 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 uh, yogis meditating in the Himalayas. And he said, who are you? And they said, we are the yogis of the Himalayas. And ever since that time, he wanted to run away to the Himalayas so he could go meditate in caves and meet some masters there. And, you know, he thought he had to keep running away. Well, in the end, when he met his spiritual guru, he turned out to be like 12 miles away from in, from where he lived in Calcutta. It's like <laughs> he was right there. Now, Yogananda did go on to become a wandering monk. In fact, he probably put on more miles than any monk before him, but he did it in America. He wasn't wandering around the Himalayas. <laughs> he was wandering around the U.S. on trains and automobiles in those days. He died in the 1950s, so he didn't fly much. But, you know, sometimes we have a sense of the things that are important to us. But sometimes there's also like an external force that pushes us from one direction to another. And sometimes we have a setback and that setback we can view as a kind of a terrible thing. At one point, Yogananda had this huge scandal in, in his life where uh, the, the Swami that was leading his center in LA, Swami Dharananda, who's his old friend from India, you know, some guy came in and bopped him on the nose because he thought he was fooling around with his wife, but his wife was just taking yoga classes because the people who took the classes at the time were mostly women. Uh, and, and it erupted in this huge scandal, you know, Swamis doing strange love cults with Hindu, <laughs> you know, all, all kinds of things. And, and it's what we would call viral today. Right. And then his second in command, the guy left the organization and kind of fell apart. And Yogananda was like, I've spent the last 15 years here in the, in the U S building up knowledge of yoga and spirituality and, and an organization, it's all falling apart. He's like, Lord, let me just go back to India so I can just go meditate. This is too hard, right? Trying to teach yoga here to these, to, in, in this kind of, you know, materialistic West. And, you know, he prayed, but that wasn't what was he was meant to do. And the answer was that he needed to stick around and he did. And that's when he decided to look for a different way. So he decided to, to write this book. He spent like the last decade of his life just writing this book and that became his lasting legacy. And so sometimes, you know, it's like those, you remember the, the train, you know, the, the train with the two tracks and you have this little switch. Sometimes a setback is actually putting us on a different path that we were potentially meant to take. I mean, the fact that I'm talking to you today and, and that I wrote a book about the simulation hypothesis, all of that happened because of a huge setback that I had, you know, I was at the, and I, and I write about this in Wisdom of a Yogi. I was at the height of my entrepreneurial career. I'd sold my company for millions of dollars. I was at MIT. I was like, you know, investing in companies. And then I had this, this huge health issue. I ended up having to have heart surgery. Oh, and for wow. the next nine months, I couldn't do a damn thing. And every time I thought I was getting better and I tried to jump back in the business world, like it would get worse. And I'd end up back in the hospital and they'd have to oh, put no. in another stent. It was just like this period. But the one thing I could do during that time, and I got very clear visions telling me, you know, that part of your plan, part of your story in this life, in this game of life was to be a writer. And I always knew that, but I was too busy, like making money and doing business things. And I had written two books over 10 years. And then in that next nine months, uh, what, what I did have the energy to do was to you know, get in an Uber, go to Starbucks for two hours a day and write. And then I went home and, you know, was back on the couch. And 
I, I published two books in nine months. Wow. Uh, and one of those was the simulation hypothesis, which went on to become a huge bestseller. And so, you know, it, it ended up refocusing my life and priorities and what something that, that I could look at and say, this is just a, a terrible setback. And it was, and I'm still recovering. It's five years later and I'm not fully recovered, oh, but I'm it was an important thing. And if you look at it in a bigger, wider lens, as a, you know, it gets back to that difficulty level uh, in life. Like the actors get, you know, Oscars for playing more difficult parts, right? In video games, you get more points if you turn up the difficulty level. Sometimes difficulty level is there to help us too. I couldn't agree more, man. Uh, the uh, I think the universe gives you tasks so you learn about your life, your path, and everything like that. So what what exactly is a yogi and why should we care? Yeah, so most of us think, you know, in the West, uh, we think the yogi is the someone who does the physical postures, or they're called the asanas. But it turns out in the yogic texts, those are just one of the eight limbs of yoga. If you go back to the sage Patanjali who wrote the Yoga Sutras, he gave us a definition of yoga. I and mean, yoga, the literal word means a union, right? A union between you and the divine or your true self, or as I like to say it, between the avatar and the player of the game. Right. Uh, but he gives us a definition in Sanskrit and he says, and, and I, and I do kind of a retranslation using some other translations so that I think it makes more sense to us in the West. It says yoga is the cessation of the vrittis. And what are the vrittis? The vrittis are like our thoughts, our desires, our feelings. Uh, and so yoga is the cessation of these whirlpools of thoughts, feelings, and desires in the river of consciousness. Now, what does that mean? What it means is we spend all our day getting enraged, you know, getting emotional, thinking about things we want, things we don't want. Uh, and yoga is any practice which calms that stuff down. And so meditation is a type of yoga. In that sense, prayer can be a type of yoga as well. And if you've ever done any physical yoga classes, you'll know at the end of the class, they have you lay down in what's called shavasana or yeah. corpse pose, right? Yeah. Or, or I, I like a better translation, which is peaceful pose. And uh, at the end, it feels like something is stilled, right? Something has calmed down, kind of like the snow globes. You know, if you have the snow globes, they have the little snow in there and you shake it up, you can't see anything that's inside the globe. But if you just let those things settle, uh, it's called a storm, right? The storm of Maya and Maya gets back to meaning illusion. And so what the yogis have been telling us is the thing that maintains this illusion is our attachments, our, our feelings, our angers, our desires, right? And so yoga is anything which allows that to calm down. So it could be, you know, go take a walk by the ocean or yeah, I'm, I'm actually in Silicon Valley at the moment and there's a place right next to Google called Shoreline Park where I feel like I'm a thousand miles away from Silicon Valley. And, you know, it's right on San Francisco Bay. You see the mountains uh, and it just calms me down. And, and so, so that is a modern yogi is somebody who practices some form of yoga, uh, which could be anything. And, and one of the lessons in the book is no matter how much time you have, even if it's five minutes or 10 minutes, as long as you take time to calm the storm of these vrittis, these whirlpools, right? Then you are a yogi in that sense. So, so what is, are, are yogic powers real? Do you believe like when we hear these people about levitating and creating palaces and then decreating palaces. Well, you know, it's a, a good word. question. <laughs> it's a good question. And then, you know, in this book, there are stories of guys like Babaji, who is like this guy in the Himalayas, who has been wandering around and looks like he's 25 years old, but he's really like hundreds of years old, who maintains. And so the question is, what should we think of these things? Well, why did Yogananda include these stories? First of all, it, because they're memorable, right? I, that's what I remembered about the book the first time I had read his autobiography. Uh, and, you know, stories like the bilocating saint, right, where he went to visit a particular uh, saint in the city of Benares, uh, and his father had given him an errand that says he, his father worked for the railroad. He's like, can you give this letter to my friend Babu? But I don't know where he is, so go visit this Swami first. So Yogananda goes to visit the Swami, and he sits with him. And the Swami says, oh, yeah, I know what you're, why you're here. Uh, sit down and he closes his eyes and he starts meditating. And Yogananda was only like 12 years old at the time and he's getting annoyed. He's like, well, you're not telling me where he is and you're not going out to find the guy. Uh, we're just sitting here meditating. 
And he opens his eyes and says, don't worry, he'll be here shortly. And he closes his eyes again. And suddenly, Yogananda opens the door to look outside. And his father's friend is coming to the door. And, you know, he tells him, well, the Swami told me to come here. And Yogananda's like, how could he? He's been sitting here meditating for the last hour. He goes, no, no, I saw him in the market. I saw him look physical. And so he was bilocating, right? He That's calls it the so Swami with crazy. two bodies. And so crazy. Yogananda says he saw this multiple times. Now, uh, along with the levitation uh, as well of a particular saint. And so w- when I was researching this, I started to ask people, well, do you think this is real? What really happened? And I interviewed a professor of, of Catholicism at uh, University of North Carolina. Her name is Diana Pasolka. She wrote a, a well-known book about UFOs called American Cosmic. Um, and she said that in in the academia, you know, she kind of believed these stories when she was a kid because she read them in the Catholic traditions. They have them, right? They have saints who bilocate, who levitate as well. And so she was give, given access to the canonization records of Joseph of Cupertino. And so Saint Joseph was a saint uh, who supposedly levitated in the town of Cupertino. I think it's in Spain somewhere or Portugal or where, wherever it is. But th- she said she saw the original signatures and the church had assigned a devil's advocate, a guy who she calls a big time rationalist. So the role of the devil's advocate is to disprove, you know, these miracles. So this didn't really happen. And he came back and said, you know, we've got over a thousand signatures of people that saw him levitate in the square multiple times. And so she saw those records. And so, you know, she's like, well, perhaps the Yogananda stuff is realistic as well. Like, like these things do happen and enough credible people have seen them. Um, you know, th- there's another story in there about a guy who can control an entity who I, who I say is like a jinn because he's a Muslim fakir uh, and the jinn are kind of these invisible entities in the Islamic traditions. And he could basically make any object appear or disappear. And so he would touch an object and then like a like a gold piece of gold or jewelry in a store. And he'd go out and say, Hazrat, which is the name of his entity, go get that and 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 bring it to me. And, uh, you know, later it would disappear from the shop and it would appear in this guy's hand. And Yogananda's guru saw this guy. And later what happened was uh, the person who had taught him to control the entity saw that he was using it for his own purposes. He was using it to basically get gold and, you know, to, to make money and do things. And, and he took away the power because he said, you know, you, you have a tendency from your past lives to be greedy and you, you didn't pass the test. Right. So first of all, should we take this story seriously or is it just a parable? Right. Well, it is a story about karma in the sense that imagine if you were in a video game and the test you wanted to make for yourself is whether you're going to be greedy. What better way to test yourself than to give your, give you control of an entity that can basically give you any object, right? <laughs> Materialize or dematerialize an object. And so it was more a karmic test story. That said, I went out and started to look for other instances of stories like this. And turns out there were some, even as recently as the 20th century. There was a guy, in um, a British guy who went to the city of Lahore, which was in India, but now is in Pakistan. It's kind of where I'm from, so I was asking around. And turns out there's a well-known story about a British guy who came there, and he said, if you guys can explain something to me that's in the Quran, and it might be referred to in the Bible as well, but I can't understand it. And he, it was about the Queen of Sheba. And if you guys probably heard yeah. of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, you know, she, she was coming to visit Solomon and he decided to go get her throne from Sheba, which was far away and he needed to bring it. And so he got it to come to him in a blink of, you know, in a blink by having this entity called the jinn go and get that. And they could automatically transport it wow. there. And so the story sounded crazy, right? So this guy, British guy said, I don't believe there's anybody here who can explain to me how this was done. Then I'll take it more seriously. And so he went to the tomb of this saint in Lahore called Data Darbar. And yeah, there's a lot of like kind of, you know, uh, Sufis there. And suddenly he sees this old guy with a big beard come up to him and says, tell me your question. And he told him his question. And he goes, okay, I'll explain it to you. But first, sit down, sit down here. Would you like some chai? He goes, "Uh, yeah, sure, I'll have some chai. And the guy puts out his hand like this. And he brings his hand and he gives him the cup and saucer. And the guy looks at it and he just about faints because it's the cup and saucer from his home in London, oh. right? And he looks back to ask the guy and once he starts drinking it, how did he do this? And the guy disappeared. And so it turns out this, this British guy 
decided to live there and become a caretaker of that tomb. And he's buried there. Like he's one of only two other people allowed to be buried in that tomb. And so it's a pretty well-known story. Then so you start to see these stories in recent times as well uh, about bilocation and about floating, et cetera. So I, I think these stories, it is very possible that these stories are true. And if you think of the physical universe as a kind of simulation, right? You can render and de-render objects. You can also have entities or helpers that are able to go out and get things from you, right? In a game, you can like get an object, take it out of your, your house, put it in your inventory. Now it looks like it's disappeared. It's not in the rendered world anymore, right? But it's, where is it? It's somewhere. You can then re-render that object so uh, where you are. So, you know, I came to the conclusion that although some of these stories are meant to teach us lessons about karma, some of the stories actually probably did happen because there's enough other kind of independent verifications of these types of stories. And I have this theory that these mystical things that happen, there's something about big cities with electrical grids and all this stuff and then the chemicals we eat because you know they're supposedly in like 600 different over-the-counter medications they have chemicals in there that block empathy that's what I, i've read this and that's the shit that's just flowing through the tap water right in the right city. right so we know that so like in these big cities like you never see bigfoots i mean the only thing you've ever heard is mothman in chicago that's about it but most of these these cryptids and all this mystical stuff never in big cities yeah. always in small cities where there's elect less people less concrete le less electrical grid and stuff like that so again unless getting you're using psychedelics right Right, maybe. Yeah, and I, I do think there's a connection here. You hear about Neem Karoli Baba, who, who, who was handed a bunch of LSD and consumed it in front of people and then was like, oh, no, this is like my experience of life. You know, I mean, it didn't affect him in the way that they expected it to. He was more like, I'm familiar with this. Yeah, you know? I, 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 this is my old neighborhood. Something like that, yeah. Right. Yeah. So I believe, and then when we get back to like stuff in the Bibles, are they parables or did they really happen? I have feelings that times were different. Different things happened back then. Great flood came. I think changed a lot of things up. But it's like I I believe that all these things are possible, in my humble opinion. If you get to a spiritual level beyond what the average human being can experience, you can man manipulate energy, make things disappear, make things appear. That's my opinion, I, and I'm I, I'm in on it. It, yeah. And, you know, Yogananda, you know, described how this is done. He said, well, the world really consists of light. And if you understand that, you can render. Uh, I mean, he didn't use the word render. That's my term from video games. Right. But you can use that light and manipulate it to create objects that appear there and they appear real or not real. And so once you get to that level, I mean, you know, we had a discussion at ASU where, you know, a professor asked the question, uh, you know, when will the first person live to be 150, right? And he was talking about it from a scientific perspective. And I was like, well, hang on there for a second. Yeah. You know, according to the yogic traditions, that's already happened, right? Yes. Uh, I, I mean, agree. there's a guy named, there's a guy named Dayar Baba, uh, Baba who, uh, um, who died uh, in 1990, not that long ago, actually. And the president of India, uh, you know, said when he was 73 years old, he said, look, when I was a kid, I, w my father took me to see this guy uh, 73 years earlier, or let's say 70, you know, years earlier. And he looked exactly the same as he did, did now. And his father at that time, let's say he was what, 40, 50, said the same thing when he was younger. And so there's, there's lots of stories of yogis who have lived already to be more than that. There's this guy named Trilanga Swami who was known, well known in Benares. He was this 300 pound guy who walked around naked, right? So he was really well known. Supposedly, you know, people uh, who kept a record said he was over 250 years old when he died, right? And, uh, you know, the police tried to put him in prison because he wouldn't put on any clothes. And he was just this weird childlike saint who, when he was in prison. And this is one of the stories in, in Yogananda's book that I talk about, you know, this 300 pound guy ends up on the roof, uh, like on the, on the roof outside on the prison and the police were like, okay, you can go. We're not going to try to put you in jail, jail or anything, but he was a pretty well-known guy. And so 
there's there's so many of these stories that uh, I think it's very possible as well when you start to learn about the, what is the physical body, how does it get rendered, how does it get manifested, you know? In the Bible, they talk about people, he had children and he lived to 170 years old. I mean, they say that all the time, right? Yeah, Methuselah, yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah, like eight, nine hundred years too. I mean, yeah. Go back even further in the Bible, and they've got like these these guys that lived hundreds of years, which which sounds ridiculous to us. But how much of that is also, you know, because our bodies are just deteriorating faster than they used to. Uh, but but some of that is there, there's a state called uh, you know, there's a state called samadhi, which in Buddhist and Hindu traditions is kind of the state you're trying to get to when you basically merge with whatever the infinite is and you realize that this whole thing is just like a dream, right? Just like we can create objects in our dreams. I don't know if you've ever tried like flying in your dreams or had a lucid dream where you're flying. Yeah. And I've done that sometimes. And getting back to your point about the electrical grids, you know, what happens is if you go over like an electrical grid, you, you get kind of sucked down, you get attracted to it, right? There's all these weird rules that happen in the dream state. But when, when the Buddha achieved enlightenment, somebody said to him, what are you? And he said, I am awake. Right? It was a, the, the ancient term, but that's where Buddha, Buddha and Buddhism comes from, in which if he's awake, that must mean the rest of us uh, are asleep, basically, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then there's another state where you use pranayama and energy within the body to get into kind of a, an, an incorruptible state, right? Uh, and that you can actually stay young or get younger for, for, for as long as you practice these techniques. Uh, the point, though, I, I think at some point is like, okay, why do you want to stay in this world forever? And so some of these yogis at some point, you know, uh, they they it's almost like they know this is a dream. Like, do you want to keep staying in high school for the rest of your life, even though you're the star student or like like Groundhog Day, right? <laughs> You've been through it a few uh, enough times at that point. Maybe it's time to to move on. It's a, it is so interesting. I think the world is so much more interesting than they want you to know. And it's just like we are constantly polluting ourselves with chemicals that age us, whether it's cigarettes or booze and or what we consume with our eyes and our ears. And uh, I think there's a different way. God, uh, higher entities, the one, whatever you want, uh, you know, it just seems like it's a simpler way to go. And, and when people go the easy route versus the simple route, that's when they send, tend to like, gain weight, be depressed. Dis when you disconnect from God, that's when all that stuff starts to happen. This has been a great episode, huh? Yes. Good. yes. Yeah. Man, you knock it out of the park every single it really time. Has to be on more every often time. If you'll have yeah, them. your uh, doors open anytime you want to come slum with us. Yeah, you Whereas you're more than welcome to come <laughs> so hang out with us. We love the conversation. I know our listeners will love it. One more time, can you tell them where they can find you? Yeah, so uh, my website is called uh, zenentrepreneur.com. It was the title of my very first book, which was called Zen Entrepreneurship. They can also get me on Twitter or X uh, at Riz Stanford, like the university, uh, although I'm not on there as much as I, I used to be. Like you, I've been pulling back uh, and, and, and trying to disconnect uh, a little bit from that. Uh, they can also find me on Instagram at Riz Cambridge, like the city or the university, Cambridge. All right, man. Well, uh, you were supposed to be in studio. It just didn't happen this time. Hopefully next time we can make it happen. We'd love to have you come in and hang with us. And uh, again, open door anytime you want to come on. These these uh, conversations are amazing. Again, go to samtriple.com. There they are. What is that weird? Yeah, that was. I think they. they now they're back. It. Now that it's back up, that's so weird. Um, go to samtriple.com. Thousand Oaks tonight, mm -hmm. Indianapolis. Uh, November 3rd and 4th. Oh, yeah. Uh, Comedy, Comedy Chaos on the 22nd. I got to get that up, too. Guys, go to samtrulli.com. Enjoy uh, these highlights and breakdown of our affiliate programs. Thank you for listening. Enjoy these highlights. Here's a clip from the latest Broken Sim. Dude, Megan, Megan Kelly and, and Candace Owens are going at it. About? About Israel? just the stuff going on in the Middle East. Yeah. And they're just yelling at each other, and everyone's just jerking off to it. They're like, oh, hot black chick versus a oh, hot white chick. Ah, oh. wait, who's on the who's the who's on more on the Palestinian side? Well, it's not that it's not that Candace Owens is on the Palestinian side. It's just everybody going off on these college kids. 
It's kind of like what uh, we were talking. Did we talk about this actually on the show, or was it before the show? How like everyone's getting oh, no, splintered the into show, this yeah. small group. Well, yeah, it's 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 the thing that can. It's there's no more divisive issue that gets people like who are strange bedfellows together. Yeah, on. yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. okay, you're 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 uh, anti vaccine but pro trans but also pro Hamas. You go in that quarter. Yeah. Okay. Those are all uh, the those January, are all the YouTube buzzwords. Yeah. Right there, you think buddy. January six was uh, a great attack on America, but you also uh, but don't believe it that trans should be <laughs> taken on women in sports. Yeah. But you're pro Hamas. You go in that corner over there, yeah. right? I mean, we're just splintering down to these weird bedfellows, and it's so funny because in the truth or com- community, right? The, this like kind of like um, conspiracy truther. I don't know how else to describe them, but it's so it's kind of like that part in Squid Games, where where like they they were like they were running and then once the thing stopped, if you moved, yeah, you yeah, got yeah, shot. Yeah. That's like that's like okay. It starts out with like, um, where do we start at? Okay, um. George Floyd wasn't what they told us, okay? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh my God, Black Lives Matter. Get pump, pump, okay? So everyone who did think, everyone who thought BLM was a Marxist, you keep running, right? Beep, stop. Now, okay, are, are you, uh, do you think COVID, should you should you have to stay home for two weeks? Okay, man. Okay, yeah, yep. Yeah, okay, you think mandatory vaccines are okay. Boom, you get shot. Except well, instead of shooting people, you're eliminating friends. If you take this all, like, life or death, yeah, it's yeah, all yeah. people you but, won't like, socialize with. But, who is with. true to the... To the real, like, conspiratorial truth uh, outlaw, right? Oh, you thought you thought uh, the elections were fair and balanced. You get shot. You keep going, right? <laughs> right? And There's just, nobody left at the end of this, by the no, way. No, do just, you think January 6th was an honest attack on our society? Shot. And now, like, if you think that... that that Israel should just be able to wipe out everybody. You're gone too. So now that's all is left. There's uh, nobody left. Yeah. No, there's some people left. No. Luke Radowski. Um, yeah, me. but you just you just didn't mention the issue that he's not right on. That's the thing. There's always, I mean, there's, there's no, some, everybody's wrong much. on some issue. I guarantee you. Yeah, but not the big ones. Not yeah. the big ones. They call this uh, the uh, masking off. That's what they call these moments. These masking off where the mask comes off. Because part should- of me is like, okay, so if you really want to talk about this, part of me is like, okay, there are these people that fled Europe at like the worst time just yeah. to go live over there. And they got duped by their government into going to live in these settlements on the border because they thought it was like a patriotic thing to do when right. really it was a buffer, buffer zone for the government wanted to be a buffer zone and they wanted to take casualties if something like this happened that's what your government wanted for you and i feel 100%. miserable for these people so johnny these johnny Israelis. johnny johnny it's it, so sad it all comes down to this but some people will say that those people are like horrible people and i'm not like they're not no i don't think that, I, I think the people are and there government. are there are some religious zealous like the the temple oh, mall is there's a plenty giant of videos fight yeah. Like you listen to anybody yeah. talk about the Temple Mount, it is crazy. These people take it back. These people, these people go. These people can't. It's chaos. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's like a European soccer match. But it just the- gets down to this. Yeah, okay. If we've studied history enough, we know that 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 authoritarian governments create opposition so that they can be begged to do a, a heavy-handed response. Pearl Net- Harbor, it's Netanyahu's playbook. Yeah. Pearl Harbor, 9-11, no different, okay? So so then you get into there's all of this data which suggests that Netanyahu was instrumental in the creation of not only the creation, but... but it's not data. It's his own words. Right, I mean, right, yeah. right. That's part of the data. Creation and funding of them, but data they, sounds kind of. I was just saying, d- data kind of makes it sound abstract. Like we crunch yeah, some numbers. Data is meant to be like the 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 least emotional of all the stuff, right? Actual sure. data, and then we know that Joe Biden sent Hamas seventy five million dollars. That's all come out, right? So then we have this situation, just like Pearl Harbor nine eleven, where you have this incredible defense system that somehow conveniently failed. Well, I, you know, I will say, Sam, the thing about the Iron Dome is if you look at the numbers, 
They have each one of those things, and they only have like dozens of them. It has like 20 rockets in it, each one of them. And if they launched 2,000 at once, there's just not enough of those rockets to shoot them all down. Right, okay, that's fine. That's fine, Johnny. But when you hear that people are going, it's impossible that they didn't know this was going to happen. That's the, that's the answer. And yeah. it's impossible that the IDF didn't show up they for knew. five hours later after the rave was attacked. They knew. They say right. it's impossible. They say you can get back and forth in, in the right vehicle through Israel they in knew. 45 minutes. I mean, I saw that, one. That ends it to me, okay? I, no, you're right. I saw one interview with this old guy who was he, he was an old man that was in charge of security on one of these kibitzes and he he his wife said he had been made fun of for taking security seriously and like training them and stuff but he was like listen all you need to do is hold out for 35 minutes and then the military will be here and we'll be fine Mil- 35 minutes and this old man i mean saved all these people if you believe this story he had to get his leg amputated he's sitting in the hospital and his wife is just so proud of him saying they all made fun of him and said, oh, you you worry too much. It will never happen. And he was just like, he trained them and trained them over the years and made sure that they were ready to fight if something happened. And they had to fight for six hours before the military. And, they, he, and he had always said 35 minutes, and that's what the military told him. So, yeah, of course they weren't. I mean, they, yeah, were, that's they, my they wanted it to be that's bad. That's all though. it is. I'm not anti-Jewish. I'm not anti-Israeli. It's that you government. Want... That government is well, evil. Well, it's also that... Word is is that Netanyahu was going to face a giant protest right around that. He might have been facing prosecution. One hundred percent, and he's still going to. The way they I say it's so. like his days are numbered. I hope that's true. And now they're bombing the shit out of of uh, Syria and. If you believe Lebanon? Ben Shapiro, that he's like a the mainstream. He calls it the the center right party. Is the the you know his which is ben ridiculous. Ben Shapiro's brand is taking a giant. <laughs> Go deep, homeboy. Eric, open your mind. Drink from the fountain of knowledge. There's lizard people everywhere. That's some interdimensional shit. Wake up, Aaron. This is only the beginning. You just blew my mind. Tim Foyle hacked. Tim Foyle h